Chief Strategy Officer for a company called Nextroid that focuses on providing measurable safety. Uh, it's headquartered out of Boston, but I'm coming to you now from Santa Barbara. I also have Cur Lieutenant Colonel Manuel Agarte with us, and uh, he has actually worked in us, uh, with us on robotics for many, many years. Uh, we'll introduce him a little bit later. Uh, we've got Alex Bates, uh, a luminary in the AI field, uh, both an entrepreneur and a now a proud venture capitalist. Look at him. Look at those eyes. He's ready to make some money. And then we have Julie, uh, who has a uh, long background in, in human factors and, and cognitive psychology. She's worked in robotics. Uh, she's been in the Navy at the Office of Naval Research. Uh, but right now she is at Johns Hopkins. So, uh, and specifically the Johns Hopkins uh, Applied, uh, Applied Physics Lab. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is the importance of ethics. And the sort of provocative question that we asked here in our title is, are there times where it is, in fact, unethical to not use artificial intelligence? And, of course, we'll also dis you know, discuss the converse of that, uh, which is when is, uh, when is it unethical to use AI? So we're really going to try to look at this issue from both sides. We've got a great group here from different areas. Uh, we've got representation from the Army, from the Navy. Uh, from academia, from from uh, the venture capital community, uh, and and in my case, uh, you know, you've got you've got a background from the national labs, from uh, robotics, and also now from the automotive industry. So I think uh, with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up our first speaker to share his thoughts on this question. I've known Alex for many years. Um, Alex comes to us right now from. San Diego. He was actually a founder of a company called Mtel, and Mtel looked at how to predict risk and failure in industrial systems using artificial intelligence. It was a really kind of classic example of how you can put the human brain and a machine brain together using AI, really good heuristic methods, and get some really significant benefits. So uh, that was a big success. He sold the company, and now he's leading a venture capital company called Neocortex Ventures. Some of you will also know Alex from his book, Augmented Mind, which has actually become quite a notable bestseller. So with that, Alex, uh, maybe you can share with us some of your thoughts about how to get the best out of the human and machine brain working together. Yeah, well, I think it's a fascinating question about uh, when is it, would it be ethical, unethical to not use AI? And in general, I think, we look around the world, there's a huge amount of, uh, of suffering still. Anyone who's been to Children's Hospital, for example, knows that I don't think we're ready to shut off, you know, science and technology and tools like AI to help address some of these grand challenges we still face today. Um, I also think that some people have a perception that AI is this looming thing that's out to basically replace human intelligence and take away our jobs. And it's true that certain types of AI do fall into that category. And I think a lot of today's AI has been messed that has sort of been uh, communicated as if it is doing that. And certainly you can save costs and eliminate certain types of labor. But what I really got excited about at my last company, Mtel, is where we were creating these machine learning systems. And I was going out in the field and working with these um, people at actually like refineries and oil and gas facilities. And when I saw how they combined their human intuition with these AI technologies, it, that's when we kind of got these amazing results and, and they were just very complimentary. So to me, that was the spark of what led to this book, Augmented Mind. But to me, I think the exciting path forward is this hybrid symbiotic connection between the two. Certainly, though, there's some complexities to discuss in terms of which types of AI qualify and so on. So I look forward to discussing on today's panel. Thank you so much, Alex. I really appreciate your thoughts on that. We'll have lots of good questions for Alex. So as I said, I've actually done some, some really interesting robotics work going back a decade with Lieutenant Colonel Manuel Agarte. He's actually the director and strategic account manager for the United States Army's Combat Capabilities Development Command. The Army really, really likes acronyms. Uh, the CCDC. Uh, boy, that's a good one. So most recently, we've been discussing his role in, in how to bring AI into uh, not only the Army, but into the world at large, looking at AI as sort of the connective tissue 
that brings together uh, so many different areas, economics, politics, technology, and, and our daily lives, and now, of course, medical as well. Uh, so, so Manuel, you, you come to us with this sort of deep, deep understanding of defense, which is obviously a, a very interesting perspective on ethics. Um, but you also have a strong background in, in data and big, uh, big data analytics. So, so with that, let me, uh, let me open up the floor to you. So I appreciate the introduction, Dave. Can you hear me okay? It's got a little bit of a lag. Good. So, uh, you know, this has been a fascinating uh, journey since we met back there, uh, back in 2007, 2008. And let me tell you, Dave, uh, back then, uh, that I, I was just keeping the, the surface, and I believe I, I'm still doing that uh, to go on this journey. So being being involved with uh, robotics and uh, and human or is a human machine in, in interaction to get things done, it's been quite a trip. But uh, right now, I find myself as part of this uh, army command, and what we're doing, we're looking at modernizing the army, taking the army to the next ten, twenty years. So some of the technologies that we are investing in and prototyping that we envision is that AI, like you mentioned, that connective tissue that is going to enable them to to collaborate and uh, and be able to, to, to execute what they decide to do. So to be able to do that, you need data. Some of that data is representing a close enough behavior that we envision that technology to do. So what is, you know, you know it's not just a bunch of rules that we wanted to do. It's also going to be within the rule of law. How are they going to be performing and augmenting our decision space in a way that we can trust them to lead us into, into a, a space that is ethically uh, uh, right. You know, so that's kind of like one of the areas that ethics comes into play here. Not just a bunch of rules, but it's also how the data is going to be taking human behavior into a direction that we want it to be aligned with the, uh, the rules of engagement and the rule of law and the morals that and the values that we that we believe and that we perform in the uh, in the own process. So that's just one take, and then we'll be diving to another examples later on. David, you're muted. There you go. David, you're muted. Oh yeah, still muted. Well, I I was having audio problems, Manuel. We we could hear some of what you were saying, but not all of it. So maybe um, you can take a moment to sort of uh, check out your mic there. But um, but we did the part of it we did catch. We really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, so Dr. Marble uh, comes to us right now from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And uh, I've known Julie since I'm um, thinking about 2002. Uh, so we're going on almost 20 years, kind of crazy, right? Uh, we've published lots of papers together. Uh, she got her PhD in cognitive science and also in human factors from Purdue. Uh, and we worked together at the Human uh, Systems Lab at the Idaho National Lab, where she did a lot of sort of groundbreaking work, if I, if I may say so, in, in robotics. Uh, she then went on to become an entrepreneur and actually uh, was the CEO of a very successful company called Sentient. And Sentient's still around now, doing amazing stuff in AI, uh, prognostic and diagnostic analysis uh, to predict life in, in bearing and, and gears. Um, she also intel developed intelligent reasoning system uh, for uh, diagnosing potential bearing failure in the F-35. Uh, she went on then to become a program manager at ONR and did very foolish things like invest in my research. Uh, and 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 then now uh, she's currently a senior scientist at the Intelligent Systems Lab at Johns Hopkins. So, with that, Julie, uh, let me hear your thoughts, please. So, I'm taking a bit of a different tact uh, from from my fellow speakers. Right now, I, I see AI as a huge potential, but it's unrealized, and a lot of that unrealized potential comes down to to ethics um, but the the source of that issue is simply that when developers develop AI 
there is this engineering tendency to say, hey, we're going to engineer the human out of the role. We're going to engineer the human out of the system. The AI is going to do the task. And the fact of the matter is the human is always going to be the consumer of, they're going to be on the system, in the system. They're going to be some form of consumer for the system. So the AI needs to act As more than just a tool, it has to actually be a teammate. And in order to be a teammate, it has to have a shared understanding of goals, intents, and reason about how changes in the context actually change the intent and goals of the person in that situation. And it also has to be able to reason about how changes in that context affect the human um, and, and be able to make ethical decisions in more than just a pragmatic manner. So we're talking about, you know, the difference between utilitarian ethics um, and Kantian ethics. So moving forward that way. So right now, you know, we look at at how systems are developed and we've seen with AI right now, there's all kinds of issues, especially with like reinforcement learning where the data set itself causes bias. And if we have systems that are already biased, we don't understand exactly how they work. I'm not sure that it could, it is always ethical to use them because we don't understand the boundaries on the system and where it will err. Yeah. Well, Julie, thank you for that, for that perspective. Uh, So we've heard different, We've got different uh, life experiences here. Uh, Each of the people on the panel has certain. It's like when is a very important piece of of machinery going to malfunction or need uh, service? With uh, Colonel Agarte, it was when are robots trustworthy, right? Do we trust them to uh, respond quickly with fire? Do we uh, trust them to uh, find landmines effectively or, or IEDs? Do we, effect, you know, do we trust an AI system to effectively distinguish between a buried piece of trash and an IED, for instance, right? Um, and, 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 of course, with Julie, you know, she's done all kinds of things with uh, – uh, everything from from figuring out you know F thirty five cockpits to uh, uh, predicting gears and and how they're going to function and then of course all the fun stuff that we did the ro- with robots. So I'm going to ask each of you right now uh, to kind of pick one specific example where you think it might be unethical to not use AI. So this is just a, a an icebreaker here to get us started. Uh, uh, so, so Julie, let's start with you. That's an interesting question because, you know, right now we're not using AI for very many applications. So if we're talking about AI as they stand right now, I don't think that I can pick a single application where it would be unethical simply because I do see the inherent flaws in how the AI are being developed. So I'm not sure that that I can answer that question. Right now, AI as it stands is our, our, like we said in the early days of computing, you know, trash in, trash out. And until we really understand how to select our data set and understand what the AI are queuing on when when they are learning the bounds of their answers, um, I think that, I think that's the problem we have to solve first. All right, Alex. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'd allude to the beginning. I'd go back to, um, I mean, you know, human suffering. I'll start with that, and even child suffering. If, if um, you know, whether it's anti-human trafficking use of tools or, or. And, and I'll agree with, you know, with Julie, the point about, for example, AI for cancer, we got a long ways to go. You know, we've barely even started shipping away at that. But I do think there's a role for large scale data analytics and even augmenting doctors and sort of decomposing their amazing intuition, right, where they factor in these external factors and human factors and psychological factors into their diagnostic process. 
but I do think that there's a role for AI to play there, and, and it would be unethical to sort of cut off that, um, you know, that effort. Um, obviously, there's there's questions about bias in other realms, but yeah, I, I would say I, I hone in on medical for my example. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, lots of lots of need in the medical community right now, given the global pandemic, right? Uh, and plenty of other health problems too. Um, Colonel Agarte, uh, what are your thoughts? Let me tell you, um, this was a phenomenal uh, uh, framing of the question. So you, you got me uh, going around. And when I need to get the right answers, the first person I go to is my wife. And uh, my wife happens to be a lawyer. So, of course, she always have the right answers. Yeah, I'm lucky for that. So let me tell you, Dave, there's a, there's a phenomenal case that I, that I find myself into regarding the, uh, the use of AI in the legal profession. Um, so there's a case where actually, and this article just came out a couple of months ago, where there's a firm that needed to go over 2 million pieces of document. They contracted 100 lawyers using 25 documents an hour and 40 hours a week. And then there was this AI tool called Text IQ that was basically competing with them. Same thing, two million uh, pieces of documents that they had to uh, search. The turnaround time for the lawyers was about 20 weeks. The tool did it in two weeks. The level of accuracy of the tool was 99.9% on the research piece. While the lawyers, their accuracy was about 90%, which is not bad, but it's talking about 20 weeks. So the overall cost of that service with the law firm and the 100 lawyers was about $4 million. The booming cost of the AI tool was about a $1 million. And it's basically because you had a lawyer on time and then a software designer that has to build. So um, now, I mean, I'm setting the stage because now in the legal profession, the American Bar Association is dealing with, you know, if you have the AI tool available, is it ethical not to use it? Meaning you're going to pass on the, uh, the, the the fees, the legal fees to a, to a, to a client that by using AI, you're re drastically reducing the, uh, the, the cost associated with the service. So it, it is really interesting how now we get into the ethical dilemma where the tools are available. When is it unethical not to use it for the benefit of your client? Now putting that into what Alex was alluding to, the medical field, where now AI has the, it can give you the capability for a surgeon or a diagnosis to reduce false positive, false negatives. Uh, is it ethical not to use that technology now that it's available? Now where the patient is going to benefit from that. So you can continue peeling the onion because obviously there's going to be some concerns about the future of work. So people are going to say, well, does that mean that we're going to have AI lawyers versus something else and i don't think so i think that right now what it's doing is it's giving you capacity it's giving the service provider capacity so you can have more of a human to human contact do what humans do best and hopefully communicate better and then have that extra capacity to fine tune and and, and give uh, uh an optimum uh, kind of service so anyhow that's just an example right there uh that uh, that i found fascinating Excellent. No, that's very good. And you really brought that to life. Thank you. Got a couple uh, of folks joining us here, which is great. Um, so the flip side of that, you know, like Elon Musk famously, you know, brought up a lot of the challenges of of using AI, uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, many sort of very famous people have been talking for a long time, as says Hollywood, about the danger. Are there specific dangers that any of you want to call out where you're essentially saying, you know, this is an area where I really don't want AI? And Julie, you've already kind of brought up some of the challenges. So I know this to some extent has already been touched on. But um, if any of you want to call out a specific area where you can say, I really don't want AI making decisions in this area of my life, that would be great. I'll, I'll throw out one that I think is top of mind for a lot of people, which is, social media currently seems to be optimized for engagement and the uncomfortable truth is that there are some of these primal things with humans that we like discord and we'll click on links that provoke anger 
And if you if that's your objective function and you continually optimize, you end up with this incredibly fractured polarized population, aka Earth 2021. So um, I'd highlight that as as a one that needs to be curved, um, you know, and, and a, a very suboptimal. Yeah. Maybe we can use AI to fix the, the AI that's controlling social media, right? <laughs> uh, I say it somewhat tongue in cheek, but in, in all honesty, a lot of it comes down to who's designing the AI and for what reason, right? So if right now, social media and e-commerce is specifically designed to to make you feel anxious and that's how people are making money, that's how you know, corporations are making money, then that's AI that's got a bent. It's got a, it's got a purpose, and it's, it's not a, a purpose that I like, right? And, and apparently you don't like it either, Alex, right? But the corporations do. Um, there's no reason, I would submit, why you couldn't have AI that helped you recognize or flag social media that was inflammatory, right? And, and, and essentially did exactly the opposite, right? You could, you could design AI to assuage people's frustrations and help them find common ground. Uh, we're just not doing that, right? Um, well, uh, do, uh, Colonel Ligardi or, or Dr. Marble, do you, have, do you have any other thoughts? So I think my greatest concern is, you know, and I want to clarify, I'm not saying that we should not use AI. I think that we should use AI, but we have to do it with an understanding of the boundary conditions and an understanding of of how the system is going to fail, where it can fail, and make sure that we're communicating that information. Um, you know, the, the whole explainable AI, transparent AI concept is, is a good concept insofar as it goes, but it's not sufficient. As soon as you take any system out of the test environment, you're putting it into its boundary conditions. And I think that the critical issue is that we've got to understand what the, the consequences are, the, the failure, the potential failure, failure conditions and the consequences of failure and account for that before we apply. So we have to be ethical stewards of the application of AI. Um, and I think that your example of social media is exactly that case. I don't know that folks um, knew that it would have this, this uh, effect when it was first deployed, but it does. And now it's, actually being used that way. Um, and so we, as you know, the supervisors, we have to be ethical stewards of the deployment and take a look at those. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, so Alex, this question is for you. Um, in your book, Augmented Mind, you kind of talk about the ability for uh, AI to really augment human intelligence. very different vision in augmented minds. Maybe you can take some time to talk about how you think the confluence of human and machine intelligence can be optimized. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think a lot of the perceptions about um, concerns about the AI takeover build towards and I understand that you know humans are only proof of you know human level intelligence there's us we're the most intelligent life form here I think if we have a vision of superhuman augmented intelligence where we're going on a path of augmentation that we can go to an amazing point if all of our effort goes towards replicating humans some of that has to happen because that's how you learn how intelligence works but yeah the book came about partly because um, you know, echo Julia's comment, a lot of today's AI, some of it is overhyped, but there, there are certainly some amazing applications. But the best application I saw at Intel was this hybrid approach of the humans interacting with machine learning systems and, and getting the strengths of each in a very complementary fashion that the humans had these amazing intuition and also things we had no sensors for, you know, these contextual environmental things that if you tried to have sensors for all these things, you would actually overwhelm any current machine learning engine. So that's where you know, humans brought this contextual part in. The machine learning picked up 
patterns that, that no human could ever get, right? Nonlinear, all kinds of patterns that would be way too subtle. So the best of both worlds is the, the symbiosis. And I thought that we need more of the AI community to sort of embrace and build towards that as, as a new vision. And, um, and, that, and that, I think, will help also with some of the fears that we see you know, going on today. Yeah, and, and Dr. Marble, in some of your research, you've looked at not only the ability for human machine teaming to be really effective, but also some of the interesting examples where there's been a fight for control and what you might call the suboptimal. One of the interesting um, things that just occurred this week is, is Forbes actually had a article that came out indicating that a lot of the ADAS behaviors, the adaptive driver assistance behaviors, are actually sort of limiting performance and increasing risk. Mm-hmm. Right? It was a big like, oh no, you know, like that wasn't our ideology. That wasn't the hope uh, at all. So, so what is causing that? And 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 Dr. Marble, maybe you can share our your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I think that Alex's point um, is a good one. I mean. Pushing, you know, pushing the discussion of a singularity event where, you know, we eventually, you know, we, where we create Skynet and, and everything takes over. Um, it, I go back to that engineering attitude and some of the, the places where we've seen, you know, a fight, if you will, between, between what is supposed to be an autonomous machine or an, an intelligent machine and a human is exactly things. I haven't read the ADAS article in Forbes, but the Supermax that issues from two years ago. The system was taking action based on a sensor that was was frozen. And in this case, the information pass was disabled to the pilots, but the system's taking action. The human doesn't know why. And, it, and, and the supermax would automatically pitch down when that sensor failed. And, this, and the, the pilots didn't know what was going on? They didn't know why the sense, why the the why the plane was pitching down, and they would get into this control fight. And so, this whole thing about explainable AI, it's it's not sufficient because what actually I think we need is a system that understands our goals and our intents and can can make um, inferences about what we're trying to do. That's what human teammates do. That's called theory of mind, and it's a critical aspect for. Well, for pretty much all mammals and a, and a bunch of birds and everything else, um, we know what our teammates are good at. We get an understanding of what they're bad at. And that's why things like apologizing when you mess up help make that team come back together. And AI can't do that. It can't say, um, it can say, well, I thought this was happening. But until it knows what your goal is, it can't really do that. And I go back to this whole thing about, you know, test environments. Test environments are controlled environments. And as soon as you take that system and you put it in a real world environment, you're already at that boundary condition. So what I want to get away from is this concept of an AI as a tool. I want a teammate. I want an AI that can know what my goal is. And adapt to me. And some of the research that I'm doing right now is looking exactly that. We've got a very, very simple task. It's a, it's a collaborative card game. But the AI actually has to be able to say, oh, Julie gave information to that teammate and didn't give me any information at all. I can make these inferences. And with the bots that we're using right now, they can't make those inferences. And because they're coming at this very simple task, with a completely different strategy, even though these bots, when they're working by themselves, they are superhuman, the human machine system fails mm-hmm. or very, very poorly. And so, yeah, that's, that's what it is. We need, to, we need to enable an AI to make inferences about us. And I like what Alex was saying about, you know, this, about the intuition and, and measuring the human. I don't know that we need to always have BCI, brain computer interfaces, but when a person invades another person's space, you blush, even if it doesn't show up on your face. You get a rush of heat to that space. You can you can use a thermal camera and pick that up on a sensor and say, oh, I just invaded your space as a robot. I should back off. You can get, you can get eye tracking, you get all this stuff. Um, so I, that's what I think, that's what I want my 
Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and a lot of those cues are so readily available. I mean, you gave one example, but there's literally like a million. Um, you know, there it's it's not it's not that hard. Like if you look at our cars right now, uh, there's very little mutual cueing going on between the human and the so-called AI in the car, and it it's sort of amusing to me because. If you recall back in like the early 2000s, I remember writing a theory of human behavior for the robot yes. that would monitor how the human used the robot and how many times the robot yeah, had run. Yeah. yeah, and it was like the simplest thing to do because it could tell bad driving really easily and then change the level of autonomy. It was like the, well, the even, simple. Even, even like with the Tesla, with the Tesla accidents and the, the fire truck accident. If you just put a you put an eye tracker on the dash and you know that your user isn't paying attention and you further know because this is really well studied that it's going to take them between three and five seconds to actually cue back in and you can bring your human back into the system when they've stopped paying attention. It's I, 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 this is where I want to go and well. Well, I just want to, because I'm jumping out of my seat, because one of the things that I find fascinating is that, you know, are we setting the wrong expectations for AI? And the reason I say that is that, you know, I think we're going, we're galloping into this AI space. We want to open Pandora's boxes left and right without really, I mean, we, we are, because we are fascinated by it and we have a vision of, of what this might be. We read it in Isaac Asimov. We read it in science fiction. We want to get there yesterday, but yet we perhaps are dealing with a child. We're a child that is still learning the world, and we want that child to become an adult like this. So I did a chicken scratch right here to get my point across, and this is basically on the y-axis, the level of autonomy, and then the experience. So if for an adult, that's Mr. Guy over here, that guy, you know, high autonomy, high experience, he can behave like an adult. But then if you can, if I can take you to my other and be Mr. Roboto all that you can be for us based on that mental model, that vision that we want him to be. He's still a child. So, yeah. you know, here we are. again, we want him to grow fast, but is that, is that right? I, 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 I love what you're saying. One of the, I, I absolutely love what you're saying. One of the, one of the areas of research that I've been, um, I've been just so fortunate to collaborate with my, my colleague, Ar Ariel Greenberg. We're talking about how can you give um, a, a machine what he calls moral, sight, moral scene assessment, which um, to look at, at, at a scene, to look at the, the context, and to be able to re reason about potential harms to the human. And in the work that we've been doing, we start off with a really simple task, which is how should a machine pass you a pair of scissors? And you, we all know that you pass them handle first because if you pass them pointy end first, bad things happen. Um, and we don't want bad things to happen. But how do you, how do you explain that? If you just go with rule-based behavior, it's, those rules are getting brittle. There's always going to be an exception. So how do we... How do we enable the machine to actually reason about potential harms? Because there's more than just physical harms. There's social harms. There's ethical harms. There's, there's mental harms. There's organizational harms. And so how do we enable a machine to be able to, to think like that? And that's the kind of experience that you're talking about. And I, I love what you were <laughs> Well, this has been, this has been great. I, I see we have a couple of people here in our, our room, and I wanted to see if they have any questions. So... Uh, if any of you that are joining us do have a question for the panelists, you can click the uh, grab the mic function, uh, or you can I think you can comment to us as well. But uh, if not, then I'll just continue asking questions, which I'm happy to do. I've got lots of questions. So so let's let's ask another one here. Um, 
Let's talk a little bit about big data. So one of the things that AI is really quite good at is processing large amounts of data, right? We, we can kind of give, uh, you know, computers a big pat on the back for being much better than us at searching through text. And, um, you know, what I, what I find, though, is that the more that we become dependent on, on machines to kind of search the grand space of solutions and, and information for us, it, it gives them some ability to kind of influence uh, us in all kinds of different ways. And, and I know that, uh, Colonel Lagarde, you've been thinking about this. So, so maybe you can share some of your thoughts. How does the choice of training sets, how does the choice of, of, of how we write those algorithms affect us? Yeah, that's, 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 that's definitely quite a, quite a dilemma, especially when you're trying to get data of systems that are either early stage prototypes or do not exist. And then you just gotta start making trade-off analysis or investment decisions on systems that you are, I, I know I'm gonna see this five years from now, but yet because of how our budgeting, like Department of Defense budgeting works, you gotta work into futures money. So now you have to be able to be comfortable with assuming risk in a certain way. Uh, so you, what do you do to minimize that risk where you go to your experts? So basically your community of practice and basically let them, hey, we, we have this data that we think that is gonna you know, replicate or it's gonna be close enough to the system that we envision on developing and then gotta be the ones betting and say, yeah, we, we think this is gonna be the, good enough at this point and then pass that on to your machine learning process and then hopefully you start seeing some interactions or behaviors that you're anticipating to to see and then start doing some testing around that. But those are big bets, you know, because right now when you're doing, when you want to have multiple machines behaving in a certain way and you want to see how they interact, you see how this can get compounded right, right from the start because you're going with a massive amount of data that still there's a margin of error that is pretty large because it's an early stage on developing on new technologies. So yeah, I mean, basically re reciting on a, on a, on a community of practice of, of subject matter experts that can vet that data and then like put the stamp of approval, say, hey, this is, this is quality data and let, let the machine take it and start learning from it is one way that we go about uh, future design. Um, but you know, again, it's, it's going back to big data, it doesn't help you if you're designing a cockpit or uh, and, and out of the sudden you start collecting insurance, you know, submissions. I mean, it has to be the right data. It has to be something that is meaningful and has to be, it has to fit the system that you want to, to evaluate or, or build. So yeah, in, a, in, in the Department of Defense, they're going through a lot of painstaking processes to make sure that taxpayers are informed because we work for the taxpayers. We have quite a bit of oversight, including our, you know, congressional stakeholders. And trust me, they do have a stake on that because a lot of the places where this technology gets developed is in their in their in their neighborhood. They want to make sure that what they're producing is also quality and there's due diligence in the way we go about it. So that's kind of what I've observed, uh, especially now when we're looking at modernizing uh, the army. I mean, these are these these, these are uh, very robust and delivery processes to make sure that the data that is being employed is being used the right way based on what we know now. And, and, and I mark my words when I say what we know now, because we understand this is a dynamic process, just continue to change, but we gotta start somewhere. So. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you. Um, so we do have a question, very exciting. Uh, please comment about the role of anthropology, neuroscience, and cognitive behavior expertise to be an integral part of AI teams when lives are at risk. So quite a lot there in that question. And we have a grand total of 120 seconds to answer it, but it is a very good question. So any of you like to jump in on that? Um, I'll, I'll jump in and kind of echo what Manuel was saying a moment ago. Um, one of the things that I think um, allows for some of the greatest potential to incorporate anthropology, neuroscience, and cognitive behavior expertise into a, uh, AI teams is this concept of directed reinforcement learning. But rather than, you know, looking at the learning and then directing it in time, 
actually doing in real time and cueing, as we're saying, off of the human behavior, cue the, the AI in real time. I think that has a potential to actually um, you know, leverage anthropology, leverage neuroscience, a leverage, leverage cognitive behavior. Um, so I think that's one potential way to do it and give the AI an ability to understand what the human is cueing on in the context. And I'll jump off and let somebody else Alex, any, any thoughts on this? Uh, this I, I love the idea. I think we really need more multi interdisciplinary, you know, data scientists is a very monoculture and these are, you know, our people, we love them, but we also know there's a lot of other perspectives. So I think that's a, that's a great idea. And I think that's a key path forward. Yeah, I do think that we've approached AI in a very sort of homogenous way, and I don't like it. I mean, I have to look at the last uh, 30 years of AI. It's it's very surprising how narrowly minded and focused it is. I mean, you can make the argument that nothing being done in, in Silicon Valley right now uh, in the autonomous driving world is less than 30 years old, right? None of it. You're building up big models and you're using cameras and lasers. You know, it's not a bad idea, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's not terribly innovative. And I think neuroscience and anthropology do have a lot to offer us. Um, uh, my uh, seven-year-old niece wrote an essay yesterday about how animals have so much to teach us. <laughs> I thought, like, that's, that's pretty true. And actually, most uh, AI folks are not looking at biology, right? Um, and And I think we we, we have some folks who are looking at it, you know, at a very, very deep level, looking at like neurons and saying, you know, let's build brains with neurons. And it's like, okay, well, that's very similar to trying to fly with flapping wings, right? And then we have other people who are sort of looking at it at a very, very, very high level saying like, hey, let's get AI systems to build giant maps, right? Um, and kind of think like humans do. Let's create a human-like brain that drives a car like a human would.